Welcome back to the MMA Meeting Pockets, everybody. Some exciting fights coming up. Adesanya versus Whitaker is going to be insane. Can't wait for that. But going back to the previous card, everybody's talking about Sean Strickland's defense. Least hit fighter in middleweight history. And he defended 172 out of 194 head strikes from Jack Hermanson. He is extremely good at protecting his head. His angling off is on point. His parries are on point. His guard is extremely good at pulling away from punches. But even those don't protect you as good as our sponsor today, Private Internet Access, the world-leading VPN. A VPN or a virtual private network is when your private network reaches to the public network using encrypted connection. This means your IP address will be hidden, your data is encrypted, ultimately making you a lot more secure on the internet. This is great against any kind of malicious site. It secures your information from other people. And private internet access gives you the absolute best experience for a VPN. Works with all different kinds of streaming services so you can watch your favorite content worldwide. And also works on all different kind of platforms from Windows to Mac to Android to iOS. Whatever you use, it will be available for private internet access. There's a reason why it has over 30 million downloads. And with one membership, you get to protect 10 different devices, which is like assuring and protecting a whole household of devices with just one membership. I personally love using it. Number one, it's extremely secure and protective. Number two, I get to watch other content that are outside my country. For an example, you can find Never Back Down on Netflix, which is no longer available on Netflix for the United States. And number three, one of the most important things for me, the connection speeds. With my line of work and what I usually do from a day-to-day -day basis, I need fast connection speeds. And usually other VPNs generally slow down the connection speed. Private internet access does not. Their sophisticated servers are going to keep the speeds fast. And with the unlimited bandwidth, you can send as much data through the VPN and it will not slow down the connection speed. I use this every single day and I never have issues with the connection. If you guys use the link in the description, you get a special offer, a complete digital privacy for less than $2 a month and four extra months for free. In order to get this offer, use the link in the description and get the best privacy that you want. A lot of people are looking down on Sean Strickland's performance against Jack Hermanson. For some reason, people expect expect him to be like exciting go for the knockout and stuff like that when he's never really fought that way Sean Strickland's always been a defensive fighter that's why his defense is so high he focuses so much on it and in various fights for an example when he fought Kamaru Usman he was extremely defensive he wasn't even really throwing punches until like the end of the fight his sparring though is different he spars differently than he fights when he's sparring man he's trying to knock you out it's a little backwards right the way he fights is the way he should be sparring. The way he spars is the way he should be fighting. But ultimately, man, it's effective. He officially did not make it into the top five. Sean Strickland is now number six in the middleweight rankings. But here's the thing, man. If Paulo Costa does not return, I mean, Paulo Costa said he's not going to fight unless he gets Marvin Vittori again. That's probably not going to happen. That means Sean Strickland is pretty much going to be the number five ranked fighter because Costa is number five. He gets out, Strickland goes up, and not only Derek Brunson, Jared Kennanier, Marvin Vittori, and Robert Whitaker are above him. Defense is the main thing everybody's talking about Sean Strickland. The numbers got thrown around all the time. I mean, the highest defensive rate in middleweight history. One of the best defensive fighters in the UFC. All this stuff. I am not ready to put that label on him yet. Sean Strickland has good defense. He's evaded, slipped, parried, blocked so many shots from guys like Uriah Hall, who's a sharp striker. Santiago Ponzinibbio. A lot of shots from Kamar Usman. Brendan Allen. Tom Breeze. A bunch of guys who are actually pretty precise with their shots. But a lot of people are not paying attention to what kind of shots he's defending well. Headshots and body shots. He might have the lowest defensive rate for leg kicks. Get this. I actually took the time to crunch all the numbers. Sean Strickland has defended 53 leg kicks out of 262. That means he has not defended 209 leg kicks. That's a defensive rate of 20%. He has defended 20% of all leg kicks that came his way. Jack Hermanson kicked him to the leg 51 out of 54 times. Uriah Hall kicked him to the leg 18 out of 19 times. Brendan Allen, 12 out of 13. Nordin Taleb landed all 25. Court McGee, 28 out of 38. Sean Strickland just does not check kicks, man, and he just walks forward into them. The thing about it is, the leg kicks don't have much power because he's continuously walking fighters back. When you're walking backwards, it's harder to put power into your leg kicks. That's why they're not causing a lot of damage to his legs. And when they're throwing leg kicks, oftentimes he's able to connect them over with his punches. That forward pressure of his is extremely effective against most fighters. So at the end of the day, he is the least hit fighter in middleweight history. He's a lot better at defending shots to the body and to the head. He rarely ever gets hit to the head. I mean, Jack Hermanson only landed 22 out of 194 strikes to his head. That is crazy. Santiago Ponzinibbio, 39 out of 131. Uriah Hall, 56 out of 173. These guys are not really hitting him to the head that much. But his leg kicked way too often. That needs to be addressed because he is not going to be Israel Adesanya or Alex Pereira like this. As it stands right now, Adesanya and Polaton would utterly destroy Sean Strickland 
if he could not take him to the ground. Those two guys are the leg kickers of this division. And fortunate for Sean Strickland, there's not a lot of other big leg kickers. Vittori doesn't kick your legs too much. Even when he does, there's not much power in them. Whitaker's okay with them. More side kicks to the leg than anything else. Jarek Henry has pretty good leg kicks. But a lot of the other guys, Andre Muniz, Imavov, Brad Tavares, Kelvin Gastelum, Uriah Hall, Darren Till, Jack Hermanson himself, Derek Brunson, even Marv Vittori, he throws leg kicks a lot, but not too much power when he throws them. Most of the entire top 15 are not great leg kickers. So they're going to fight Sean Strickland at his own game. Most of the guys in this division back away from their opposition instead of going forward at them, right? And that's something I want to see Sean Strickland go up against in this middleweight division. He's went up against that when he fought Kamaru Usman. A guy who would meet him in the center, not back up away, and try to push Strickland backwards. Usman was one of the main guys that was able to do that. And he was extremely successful, of course, due to his wrestling. But even his shots were landing a lot easier. Specifically the jab. And that was Usman before Trevor Whitman. And he was able to stick a jab on Sean Strickland. Now, when people know Sean Strickland's knockdowns, for an example, he got knocked out by Kamaru Usman. He got knocked down and knocked out by Zaleski Dos Santos, they do take a hit on Strickland's defense, right? Because he did get dropped. He got hit and knocked down. But the thing about the punch from Kamara Usman was, firstly, Sean Strickland took a jab to the eye, which cut him open, and he couldn't see out of his left eye for the rest of the fight. Disengaging away from Usman, he took a right hand to the left side of his jaw that he couldn't even see because of his eye. And that's what dropped him. I mean, it looked like he went out when he was falling. When he hit the ground, he kind of woke up. Usman just got some crazy power, man. So how much does it reflect on Sean Strickland's defense back then? I mean, he couldn't see the punch because of his eye, but then again, he took a shot to the eye, and that's what caused all of this. Would he have gotten hit by the right hand if his eye was okay? Nobody really knows. I mean, he defended every single hook for the whole fight before he got jabbed to the eye. So who really knows? The thing was, Zaleski Dos Santos was a lot more clean. Strickland was stepping off to his left while throwing a jab. Zaleski countered it with a spinning hook kick to the temple. He parried the jab first, so he definitely knew it was coming. But to give some credit to Sean Strickland, you don't see this sort of thing happen all the time, right? This is a very hard thing to prepare for. Very hard thing to train for. But at the end of the day, man, Zaleski landed this shot, and it was one of the cleanest shots that Sean Strickland ever got hit with. Probably the cleanest. I recommend everybody go watch that exchange right there. I mean, the step-off jab is a very common technique used by everybody. But Zaleski, having his capoeira background, he's able to throw things like this out at a whim. I mean, one of the fastest spinning hook kicks we've ever seen. And this ultimately was the end of the fight for Sean Strickland. The only time he ever got finished. Soon after, he went up to middleweight. He was way too big for the welterweight division. And not being a wrestler really hurts his chances. If you're a big guy cutting down weight classes, you better be a wrestler, man. Striking with faster fighters at a lower weight class is always going to hurt you. You're also drained. Weight doesn't necessarily matter as much when it comes to striking as it does for grappling. And for Sean Strickland, it was a no-brainer to go up to middleweight. I mean, any of these guys, even you know someone like Paulo Costa, should probably stay a light heavyweight. The only people I feel pretty bad for are are the guys who are caught in between weight classes, like maybe Darren Till, like Kevin Lee was. These guys don't really have a home. They go up a weight class, they're too small. They go down a weight class, they're cutting too much. But for guys like, for an example, Sean Strickland, he's a good-sized middleweight. He should never have been fighting at welterweight. For like Dustin Poirier, should never have fought at featherweight. The weight bullying can only last so long until the weight cut starts destroying you, and you're not the same. You're not able to bully these smaller guys the same way. And speaking of guys who cut a lot of weight, Max Holloway, for those who don't remember, Max pulled out of his fight with Alexander Volkanovsky for UFC 272 due to an injury. This is exactly one day after it was announced. Yesterday, it seemed like Max got cleared from the injury. He wasn't even injured for a month, and now is asking to be the backup fighter for Volkanovski versus Korean Zombie. And Volk is ripping it to Max for this. He's pretty much saying, how are you going to pull out of a fight? And then asked to be the backup fighter for the same fight. He said that Max was faking his injury and none of it really made any sense. I don't think Max is scared of Alexander at all. I mean, they fought each other twice. The second fight was very close. And the thing is, the fight got pushed back a month. Right now, the fight is happening on April. Before, with Max, it was supposed to happen in March. Yesterday, on February 8th, Max was cleared, so he would have less than a month to prepare for Volkanovski. So I understand where Max was coming from with this. And honestly, him being a backup fighter makes a lot of sense. He's the next guy up for a title shot. At the same time, though, it is not something that Max has said he wanted to do before, right? Max said before that he'll fight whoever, and he's not going to wait for a title shot. Now he's kind of waiting for one. He wants to be the backup fighter instead of fighting someone else. Something has changed in front of his eyes, and maybe he sees that there's no one else out there. He'll fight whoever it is, and that's why he even fought Yair Rodriguez instead of waiting for a title shot. But now he wants to be the backup fighter and actually wait for a title shot instead of taking up another fight. A big reason for that is probably there's no one that makes sense for him right now. He already beat number two, three, and five. Ortega, Yair, and Cater. Number four, Korean Zombie, is fine Volkanovski. Number six is Josh Emmett. I think the only guy Max would probably take a fight up against is if Zabit comes back. And Zabit said he is coming back. So who knows what's going to happen there? Who knows how long it's going to take Max to actually get that next title shot? Maybe 
in the fall or something like that. Maybe he doesn't want to wait that long and Zabit is going to be right there. Maybe Josh Emmett gets a big win and they have him and Max fight each other. Who knows what's going to happen. But that was one of the shortest layoffs from an injury of all time. Pulled out of a fight and then stayed out for less than a month and now he's coming back. I mean, Dominic Cruz wish he was that fortunate. Dominic Cruz would get injured and he'd be out for three, four years. Max Holloway gets injured. He's only out for what, three weeks? And a former Max Holloway opponent is Dustin Poirier. He's answered some questions about what his future is going to look like. He is pretty uncertain. He doesn't know what's going on. He wants to fight with Nate Diaz. For some reason, it's not happening. Nate is saying that the UFC doesn't want it. Fans have asked him about a fourth fight with Conor McGregor. He said probably not, but he said he would take it in a boxing ring instead. Not in MMA, but in boxing. So the money he would get from a fourth Conor fight is not enticing for him. I mean, he'd make a lot of money again. I think most fighters, even if they beat Conor twice, they will still take another fight with him. But Dustin's showing more integrity about it. He wants a next big challenge, right? It's not just the money fights. I mean, this proved that I don't know if it's going to be the same answer if they actually bring that offer to the table and actually show him the amount of money he would make. It seems like he also wants to challenge himself against Conor using only his boxing skills, not his wrestling, not his kicks or anything like that. But he looked really good against Conor in the third fight with his boxing. I mean, he was actually landing pretty well on him. And that's what we have to go to here. John Kavanaugh, Conor McGregor's coach. I mean, he's being ridiculous about it again. He said that Conor was winning on the stand-up. It's the same old thing again. I mean, Conor was beating Habib. He was beating Dustin Poirier. He was beating Floyd Mayweather. I mean, Conor just doesn't lose, man. He's the best. He's the greatest. He never loses any exchange. I'm not going to lie. This sounds like one of those counter Twitter fanboys that are very delusional about what happens in fights. Like, he would be on the bottom against Habib or Dustin Poirier, and they think he's winning. Or I even heard some of them saying that he won the first round against Habib. Apparently, he was landing two to one strikes against Dustin, landing twice as much on the feet. Even though when you count the actual strikes of the fight, on the feet only, Dustin was outlanding him. And she landed the cleaner shots on the feet. Not only that, Connor's coach said that he went for the guillotine, ended up on his back and defended himself well on the ground. That's verbatim. Went for the guillotine, ended up on his back, and defended himself well on the ground. What? Yeah, he was defending himself with the same technique he showed against Habib, man. I guess Dominic Cruz's commentary about the Habib fight really stuck here. Defending shots with your face is defending well. Everybody saw the fight. Everybody saw what happened. Fans, analysts, other fighters, everybody agrees on the same thing of what happened in that fight. The only two guys that really disagree are the fighter himself, which is very understandable for a fighter, but the coach is supposed to be rational, live in reality about the fighter, not believe in certain things. There's nothing about belief. Coach then says, I thought if he went in the second round, it would continue. How it was looking in the standard portion of the fight, which was Connor landing quite well. When Connor tends to land, people tend to fall. So I was fairly confident how it would play out in the second round or maybe in the third. What? Well, he wasn't falling. He fought him in the second fight, and Dustin didn't fall in that one either. Just because Connor tends to land and people tend to fall doesn't mean it always happens. He didn't do it to Habib. They stood, they stood with each other for almost the entire third round. That didn't happen. He landed on Habib pretty well, too. Did not go down. He landed clean on Dustin in the second and third fight. Did not go down. That sounds like I believe my fighter will knock this guy out. Not analytically, how can he do this? Technically, how is he going to do this? It's not just, oh, he lands, people fall. That's not generally how it goes down. You got to make things work in order for that to happen. It's not just, when my fighter punches, man, they do tend to fall, so I believe it would happen in the second and third rounds. That's just not how it goes down. Connor's powerful, but he doesn't have Francis Ngannou power where he just touches you and you just go to sleep. In the lightweight division, you cannot bank on power like that. You cannot bank on the deadliness of your punches. Even Michael Chandler, the hardest hitter in this entire division, doesn't have that kind of power where whenever he touches you, you go down. You have to go up weight classes in order for that to be reality. I could be wrong, but it sounds like the coach has faith in his fighter instead. And it's not the first time. We've heard many coaches in the past say they have faith in their fighter. How many times have we heard this? I have faith in my fighter. That's one of the worst things I've heard coaches say. You're not supposed to have faith in your fighter because faith means believing without evidence. If you can see that your fighter is lacking in certain areas, you cannot just have faith they're going to be good in those when the fight comes. When you see certain things go wrong for your fighter in the fight, you have to bring your fighter into reality so he can fix those mistakes. When it's always, my fighter was doing this right, he was actually winning the fight, he was defending himself well. When none of this seemed real, there's nobody navigating to reality here. Everybody's believing the same thing coming off a loss. If the camp all believes that Connor was defending himself well, there's nothing he's going to change about it. He would have lost the round on the scorecards because of what happened on the ground. He lost the second round of Habib because of what happened on the ground. Even if your fighter is defending some of the shots and he's not getting hurt as much as the commentators are saying, he's still losing the round. Being in that kind of position and defending that sort of way probably isn't the best, right? It's an option to go to if you can't escape, right? If you have to deal with the blows, have to deal with the ground and pound, okay, defend that way. Okay, you're forced to defend. 
But the best thing to do is get up from the bottom. Find your way out of there, right? Many fighters have found their way out of there. So no, he was not defending himself well because he was still losing the fight doing that. That's not defending yourself well. Honestly, this has gotten so bizarre. And it's not just like some random fan saying this. It's the head coach. It's the guy that's leading the coaching. One of the most important people in the whole training camp. It's just kind of absurd when you hear from that perspective. Like, it's crazy, man. And with that, we're going to go right to the questions. We're going to start with the members first, Naresh Mulkunti. I'm sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Thank you for your amazing efforts and coming with regular quality content. Much appreciated. Thank you, man. I've always wondered why fighters say there are weight classes for a reason in a three to five round fight. You would think Ngana vs. Mighty Mouse is just criminal, but... Considering Mighty Mouse's fight IQ, I can easily see a unanimous decision victory where Nganu keeps getting touched and is too slow to catch the smaller target. I'm not advocating something so absurd for practicality. I'm just wondering how Derek Lewis would beat TJ Dillashaw regarding the weight classes. That's not a bad question at all. I mean, we've seen crazy fights before. BJ Penn vs. Leona Machida. Guys who were separated by, what, three weight classes? Actually, Lyoto was a heavyweight in that fight. BJ Penn just filled himself up. He was kind of he was kind of fat in there. I mean, he weighed, like, what, 190? And Lyoto was over 220? Clear difference in size. And BJ Penn fought well. You look at Melvin Manhoff versus uh, Mark Hunt. Huge disparity in that fight. And Melvin Manhoff knocked him out in, what, less than 20 seconds? But what we have to say here is, just to put the foundation on this, the bigger fighter that is skilled is going to beat the smaller fighter that is skilled more times out of 10 than the smaller guy will. Even though Mighty Mouse is way more technical than Nganu, out of 10 fights, he's probably beaten Nganu once or twice. Skill is the most important thing when it comes to a fight. That's why a guy like Mighty Mouse, who's extremely small, much smaller than the average person, can beat 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet, no matter what size there are, as long as they're not skilled fighters. He could beat an American football player for sure. Those guys are massive. He could beat basketball players. That's what skill does for you. And it comes to a point where a bigger guy has to be skilled enough, not as skilled as a smaller guy, but skilled enough to where the strength and size can cover the rest of the gap. And that's where Ngano versus Mighty Mouse comes into. But these are some of the more ridiculous comparisons, right? If we say, for an example, can Michael Chandler beat Derek Lewis? Absolutely. We can actually imagine the scenario that Michael Chandler beats Derek Lewis. Like, we can actually see that. Or, you know, Justin Gagey, could he beat Derek Lewis? Or can he beat Tai Tuivasa or something, you know? We can definitely see the scenario. Is it highly probable? No. But we can actually see it happening, right? It wouldn't be super shocking to see, you know, Michael Chandler lay out some heavyweight or even submit some heavyweight or something like that, right? Be very elusive, very fast, get out of the range, right? He's a lot faster than every heavyweight that's ever competed. As fast as Surreal Gan is, he doesn't compare to lightweights at all. And he outspeeds these heavyweights to the point where they can't even find him, right? Imagine that. These guys can't even touch him. And he is like half the speed of the lightweights. Could we see a scenario where... On the feet, Wonderboy Thompson is tooling with some of these heavyweights. Absolutely. We consistently see guys from smaller weight classes, lower weight classes, go up to heavier weight classes and perform very well. This usually can happen when striking is more involved in the fight. When wrestling's involved, the bigger guys are going to have a natural advantage and be able to overcome the smaller, more technical fighter using their size and strength to keep them down and do what they want on top of them. In the striking area where speed is a lot more significant and the fact that you can knock out anybody in the world right bj penn can knock out a heavyweight if he lands correctly these kind of things that mesh together i mean melvin manuel knocked out mark hunt with one punch and we've seen mark hunt take shots from heavyweights and not go down like that speed was so significant in that kind of fight even manuel moving backwards taking a lot of power off of his blow able to put down the much bigger man striking wise you could be a lot smaller and still get ahead of your opponent so the style is definitely going to be a huge factor in this right mighty mouse versus francis and ganu i'm not gonna lie i could definitely see a scenario where mighty mouse is able to get away from everything and ganu does as long as and ganu doesn't shoot him for takedowns and able to get by on a decision victory because of course mighty mouse is not going to gas out and ganu is going to gas on five rounds for sure trying to catch this much smaller target and that's the big thing as well and ganu is going to have to catch mighty mouse how many times did mighty mouse win out of 10 fights, maybe once or twice, but it's definitely possible, right? TJ Dillashaw versus Derek Lewis. This is actually a lot easier for a smaller fighter than it is for someone fighting Ngannou because Ngannou at least has the wrestling skills and he's a lot faster than Derek Lewis. I could definitely see this sort of thing as well. I mean, it's all strategy. That's what it comes down to. And the other thing is, how small is the cage? If the fight was in an open area, there was no boundaries or parameters, the smaller guy has a much better chance of winning the fight because they can constantly move away. Some people say run away at times, just land some shots here and there, and get the bigger man to gas out. That's generally the game plan that these smaller guys are going to have to go to. And for an example, TJ Dillashaw can land the right punch at Derek Lewis and hurt him. That's the main thing as well. It's not like Derek Lewis can eat every single shot TJ throws at him. There's going to be some shots, man, he does not want to get hit with. Whereas on the ground, you have to be such a better grappler than your opponent 
your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has to be so much higher than your opponent. Some guys would submit Derek Lewis for sure, right? You might be able to see some high-level black belts choke him out for sure. They're a lot smaller than him, right? Maybe uh, Ryan Hall could submit him. Maybe Brian Ortega is able to submit him or something. But the big thing that goes against some of these grapplers is the ground and pound has changed. A lot of people bring up Hoist Gracie and what he did back in the day against the much bigger fighters. Well, a lot of those guys back then did not have the same kind of ground and pound skills as the, as the, as the fighters do today. Don't get me wrong. Crone Gracie would tool with Derek Lewis on the ground. Absolutely choke him out. But there's some scary moments where Derek Lewis can just try to overpower Crone Gracie. Might, might be able to pick him up and slam him in some areas, maybe land some big ground and pound shots and put him out. The main thing that goes into this is the bigger fighters are most likely going to beat the smaller fighters pretty much no matter what. But out of probability, there are chances for the smaller guy to win. We don't want to see Mighty Mouse versus Ngannou, right? We don't want to see that sort of thing because the way Ngannou would win, he would hurt Mighty Mouse pretty badly. And it wouldn't even be that competitive, right? One punch, Mighty Mouse goes down, Ngannou overpowers him in the wrestling department. Something like that can happen for sure. So yes, I do agree with the saying that there are weight classes for a reason. And then we go to Flip 3 what do you make of the third fight between Brandon Moreno and Alexander Pantoja? Rewatching their last fight in 2018, Moreno's hands were nowhere near as polished as they are today, while Pantoja always had an aggressive pace with his BJJ. Man, that was a long time ago. Four years ago, they fought May of 2018. Brandon Moreno was such a different fighter back then. Pantoja's gotten better for sure, but he has not made the same improvements as Moreno. Moreno was so wild back then, man. That was, I believe, before he got caught by the UFC. He had to make some big changes, and he was coming off a loss against Sergio Pettis. And that fight got outmatched as well. He was so wild. Go back and watch that Pantoja fight. He was winging overhands. There were no jabs, wheel kicks. His takedowns were very sloppy. There was no efficiency to anything he was doing back then. He was such a different fighter. It's actually crazy to watch it. I believe Moreno today would definitely beat Pantoja. The jabs alone would be such a puzzle for Pantoja to solve. His body locks would be on point. His body shots. Almost everything that's new to Moreno today is terrible for Pantoja to solve. And then go to John Jordan. We keep hearing about how boxing pays so much better than MMA, but we also see how boxing is often a mess. Too many belts, fights that don't need to get made, etc. Even at MMA, people like Connor, when they do make great money, it kind of seems to hurt their fighting both in terms of desire to train and willingness to take any fight. Can greatly increased fighter pay have a negative impact on the sport? Will making boxing money cause boxing problems? Interesting question because it wasn't always like that. It's actually kind of a newer thing where fighters, when they start getting a lot of money now, they tend not to fight as much and they tend to look to boxing, they tend to look to other things, you know, go into other businesses and not even take part of MMA as much. Why they start doing movies and stuff like the modern MMA fighters don't handle money the same way as the older fighters did or even as boxers do. When guys like GSP were making millions of fight, making so much money, they stayed in the game that continuously wanted to fight. Anderson Silva made so much money, constantly fighting in the sport. Chuck Liddell made so much money and he was consistent as well. Never looking at boxing, never looking at other combat sports or doing any sort of thing like that. Anderson started to look at Roy Jones Jr. because he kind of beat the whole division already. He was without a challenge. And that's the kind of thing we talked about yesterday. But yeah, man, a lot of fighters are a lot less willing to take fights when their pay is increased. And boxers generally don't have this sort of problem either. I mean, Floyd Mayweather was making tens of hundreds of millions for years and he constantly was fighting. He wasn't as active as like, let's say, Donald Cerrone, but he was still very involved with the sport. You can even look at Canelo. Canelo's fighting a lot. He's a modern boxer. Gets paid more than most athletes in the world. And he is eager to get back in there and fight. So yeah, I do believe if fighters start to make boxing money, there will be a lot of problems. Not boxing problems. There are not going to be a lot of belts. There's not going to be fights that don't need to get made and stuff like that. But it's going to be a lot of fighters that are not willing to take fights. And then we're going to Mikbish Z. Hamza versus Whitaker. How about that? Oh, that's a horrible fight for Hamza. Put any wrestler against Whitaker and he is going to destroy them, most likely. Guys have tried to take down Robert Whitaker and no success. Even on the ground when they're able to scramble with him a little bit, like Shakari Souza, can't get anything on the guy. He is one of the better anti-wrestlers that we've ever seen in the sport, right? After Jose Aldo, you start to bring up Robert Whitaker, Prime Robbie Lawler, some other fighters like that. And trying to fight with Whitaker on the feet. Hamza's got power, he's pretty fast with his hands. But man, it's hard for me to see him catching Whitaker. I think with a Bradley Hartley. Hey Weasel, how would you see these matchups going? Aldo versus Dillashaw. For now, I'll go with Aldo. Colby versus Usman 3. I'm going to have to go with Usman again. Brunson versus Shemaev. I'm going to go with Shemaev. Vitoy versus Brunson. I'm going to go with Brunson. Barboza versus Aldo and 145. Right now, I'm going to go with Barboza. But in their prime, I might lean to Aldo. 
Holloway versus Volkanovski in boxing. I'm definitely going to go with Holloway. And I love the videos. Keep it up. Thank you so much, man. And then we'll go to Eric Perez. I always thought that if one day the light heavyweights decided not to cut weight and fight a heavyweight, they would dominate. So top 10 heavyweights versus top 10 light heavyweights. And how does Uncle Lai versus top 10 heavyweights? So like going in order, number 10 versus number 10. Tom Aspinall versus Johnny Walker. Definitely going with Aspinall. Martin Tibor versus Nikita Krylov. I'm going to go with Nikita Krylov. Shamil versus Volkan Uzdemir. I'm going to go with Shamil. Chris Dawkins versus Dominic Reyes. Interesting fight. I'm going to go with Chris Dawkins, but that's a very close fight. Rosenstrike versus Ankalaev. Ankalaev destroys. The wrestling's just going to be way too much in that one. Alexander Volkov versus Thiago Santos. Oh man, that's like what the shortest light heavyweight in the top 15 versus the tallest heavyweight. Due to those injuries, man, I'm going to have to go with Alexander Volkov. Santos is just not the same guy these days. In his prime, I'd probably pick him. I think he'd be a little bit too fast to get in. I don't think Volkov would react as fast. Right, Santos will be on him, and I don't think Volkov can get him off. One shot from Santos can also put Volkov down, I think. Curtis Blaze versus Anthony Smith. Blaze destroys, dominates. Wrestling's way too much. The ground upon would be horrendous. It would be like what we saw from Glover Teixeira, but with a bigger guy. Then Derek Lewis versus Alexander Rakic. I'm definitely going with Rakic. He is so defensively sound. It's going to be hard for Lewis to land on him. Rakic, I think, is also taller and longer. The kicks, though, man. Just imagining Rakic kicking Derek Lewis' legs and kicking his body. Man, that would be a horrible fight for Derek. Definitely going with Rakic. Then we go to Stipe Miocic versus Yuri Prohaska. Definitely going with Stipe. The wrestling is going to be too much. On the feet, anything can happen. On the ground, I don't think Yuri can deal with Stipe. Surreal Gon versus Jan Blahovic. Definitely going with Surreal Gon. I think Blahovic is a little too slow. He leaves himself open a lot when he's throwing his punches. Gon would be able to bait him, draw him in, and then counter very consistently. And if Jan wants to fight this like a chess match instead of chasing Cyril Gan, he's never going to win this, man. He's just a little too short, a little too slow, can be pretty obvious from a distance. I mean, Cyril Gan would just have to move away instead of reacting to certain things. Just move away from Jan, circle around. Jan is a plotter. He'll let you move around. And that's a horrible stylistic fight for Jan Blahovic. Then champions, just saying it feels wrong. Francis Ngannou versus Glover Teixeira. I don't even want to talk about it. I don't want to see that happen to my boy Glover. I've been watching him for too long and they get stretched out like that. I mean, what Anthony Johnson did to Glover wouldn't even come close to what Francis Agano would do. And then Uncle Live versus the top 10. Cold fight with Tom Aspinall. I'm going to lean to Uncle Live. But I could definitely see Aspinall winning. Definitely beats Martin Tibora, beats Shamil, beats Chris Dawkins, beats Rosenstrike. Close fight with Volkov. I will lean Uncle Live. Beats Curtis Blaze for sure. Definitely beats Derek Lewis, loses to Stipe, beats Surreal Gan, and loses to Nganu. And then we go to Daniel Sandoval. If Benil Dariush wins, what are his chances against Oliveira and the rest of the division? Also, love the work you put in. I can't wait for the live streams. Yeah, man, same. I'm so looking forward to starting the live streams, those watch parties, and even I was thinking about just doing live streams on another channel that's specifically dedicated for that. We look over news, look at interviews, all that stuff, and just hang out. But Benil Dariush. If he beats Islam Makashev, what are his chances against Oliveira and the rest of the division? Dariush is a very good grappler, but man, he is not dealing with Oliveira that well. On the feet, Oliveira doesn't move his head. He could potentially get caught. It's the same sort of thing we always talk about, but it's nothing new, right? Dariush is a lot sloppier than what Oliveira has been fighting. He's a lot slower. He doesn't hit as hard as like Chandler, for example. Dariush can probably knock him out, catch him something wild and unpredictable, like a spinning back fist that he knocked out Scott Holtzman with or something, you know? But it would have to be a point where Oliver is taking so much damage, he can't take these shots anymore. Right, it would have to be from the damage that other fighters have done to him for Dariush to finish him off. But too hard of a fight for Benil Dariush. I think out of 10 times, Oliver probably beats him 7 or 8. Against Justin Gaethje, he gets destroyed. Dustin Poirier beats him, but I think it's a lot closer of a fight. Islam Makhachev, I believe, should be able to dominate. Chandler destroys on a three-rounder. Five rounds, it gets interesting. I think he beats RDA today. He beats Tony Ferguson again. Beats Dan Hooker for sure. Close fight with Conor McGregor. I think Conor might be able to edge that, but definitely can go to Dariush for sure. Him versus Gregor Gillespie could be a good one. That could be a really good fight. It's almost 50-50 as well. Be a striking match for the most part. I don't think either guy are going to take the other down. I think Fiziev beats Dariush. Gamera beats Dariush. Saryukian beats Dariush. Riddell might lose. It's a close fight. And he definitely beats Diego Ferreira. And then we go to Jesse Griffin. What weight classes are seeing second comings of dominant champions? Like Usman being a better version of GSP, a stronger wrestler with good stand-up, but, but able to capitalize on opponents' weaknesses due to their well-roundedness? Or is he being the Anderson 2.0? And if Islam becomes the next champ, he'll be the new Habib. Do you think there's a certain style that is best for each division? Or is it just a big coincidence? I think it's a big coincidence because these guys are all pretty well-rounded. 
Easy is a well-rounded striker. He does everything on the feet at a high level, but he has good takedown defense. So it's not like these guys have a specific style that's good against these fighters. If they were in any other division, they'd still be dominant. Imagine a middleweight Habib. They're not stopping his takedowns. Most of those guys, they can't wrestle that well. So it's a similar kind of thing, you know? GSP, he would do the same thing if he was a middleweight size fighter. It's all about being well-rounded enough or having a specific skill set that's so strong as well as just being somewhat skilled defensively in another area. For an example, you're an amazing grappler, amazing wrestler, but you have very good defensive striking. Your offensive striking is not too good. Or amazing striking overall, but you have good defensive wrestling. Not offensively, though. That's what you tend to see from a lot of these champions. Then we go to Hydra OG. What would you change in the pound for pound rankings? What I would change is Israel being above Volkanovski because of more defenses and beat opponents more dominantly. John Jones removed for inactivity. Charles and Stipe above Max. Jan above Moreno. Whitaker above Glover. And Covington gets added at number 15. What do the pound for pound rankings look like right now? Okay. I know you asked me this before, but it looks like uh, you didn't really change the thing about Jan and Moreno. So yeah, it changed a little bit. Jan is above Moreno now. Number one is Usman, definitely should be. Number two is Volkanovski. Number three is Adesanya. The reason why I think they have Adesanya below Volkanovski is because Adesanya tried to fight at light heavyweight. Because again, remember, pound for pound means how do your skills translate to other divisions. If you become a double champion, that's the, that's the definition of being a great pound for pound fighter. But here's the thing, Volkanovski never fought a lightweight in the UFC. So how do we actually know? Adesanya, yeah, he lost to Jan Blachowicz, but as a middleweight in his own division, he's way more dominant than Volkanovski is. So yeah, I would put Adesanya above Volkanovski, just because we haven't seen Volkanovski go up in the lightweight division in the UFC. Francis Ngannou is number four. Oliveira is number five. John Jones, I believe, should be removed as well. Max Holloway is number seven. Dustin Poirier is number eight. How does that make any sense? Whoa. How is Holloway above Poirier? They both did the same thing. They both went up to lightweight. Dustin became an interim champion. Holloway failed when he went up. And he lost to that guy. He lost to Dustin twice. Once at featherweight, once at lightweight. Max is also coming off a loss twice to the champion. Yes, Dustin has lost to Oliveira. He lost to Habib. But he's been a lot of great fighters in this division as well. But the thing about pound for pound is going up divisions and being successful. Dustin has done that. Max has not. So Dustin should be above Max in my opinion. In the respective weight classes, for sure Max did more things. But how far back do you look? How far back in their careers do you count for current pound-for-pound -pound rankings? Do you look when Holloway beat Jose Aldo? Right, he beat Jose Aldo back in 2017. That was five years ago. But regardless, I'm going to have to put Dustin Poirier above Max Holloway. I think it's kind of close given the fact of who Holloway has beat. But at the same time, pound for pound means going up divisions. There is a bit of an argument for Charles Oliveira to be above Francis Agano for that exact same reason. But in the heavyweight division, it's a little bit different because there's a huge gap in weight. 265 to two, what, 207? So I would actually put Oliveira above Francis Agano for the number four spot. Definitely, I'm putting Dustin above Max. So we have Oliveira at number four, Francis at number five, Dustin Poirier at number six. Then I'm going to put Max Holloway at number seven, Piotr Jan at number eight, Davis and Figueredo at number nine, Stipe Miocic at number 10, Glover Teixeira at number 11, Robert Whitaker at number 12, Jan Blachowicz at number 13, Brendan Moreno at number 14, and Cyril Gaon at number 15. Then we're going to dangerously dubious Double Davidson. Hello, Weasel. Love your content. My major question is about Colby Covington and how he's convinced people that He's a nice guy who's forced to don a persona. When in most wrestling circles, I understood that he was an aggressive asshat whose behavior killed any chance he had to get past the national level. How do people buy in this act? Is his D1 days just not well known? Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of people don't know how he was in the D1 days as a college wrestler. But people do remember him before like the Damian Maya fight. And people remember him as like a normal guy. Like just a regular fighter, wrestled in fights, did enough to win. And had the same kind of cookie cutter answer for every question, and that was it. The main reason why people believe he's like a nice guy, I'm not saying he's nice or bad, I don't know, I don't really know him personally. The reason why people believe that he's a nice guy is because of the story of why he put on this persona, why he became so brash and everything. You know, people love him now and people hate him now, before no one cared. I remember Colby losing to Wally Elvis, I remember watching that live. Later, I didn't even know that was Colby. That's how much I forgot. I remember Warley getting that guillotine because Warley was a prospect in the sport a lot of people were talking about. Him beating Colby Covington, people were just like, oh, just some other fighter that got submitted, but it turned out to be Colby Covington of all people. He had to make something work, even though he beat Demi Maya. He was saying that he was going to get cut by the UFC, so he had to do something to get people's attention. His fighting style was not necessarily doing it back then, but I believe now his fighting style is somewhat entertaining. He's very active. A lot of output, wrestles really well. Combining that with his new persona, he brings a lot of emotion from the fans into his fights. Whether they hate him or love him, they love to watch him. Look at all the views he gets on YouTube. All the interviews, all the people talking about him. It's always a big deal when people are talking about Colby Covington or when he's talking. So he did it right. Whatever he did, he did it right. And that's why people believe that behind it all, he's a nice guy 
because he was just doing it to make money in the sport. He's not actually like this. It's kind of like, I guess he got people to feel bad for what was happening to him and he had to turn into this. So they have some kind of, I don't want to say sympathy, but understanding about him and that understanding, that sympathy for some people that brings them closer to Colby. So yeah, I don't know if he's nice. I don't know if he's mean. I don't know the guy, but all I know is from his persona and some of the videos I've seen, you know, for example, him talking to some of his fans behind the scenes. And then we go to the public questions. The first one with the most likes, do we? Do you think fighters like Adesanya and Usman know a way around the USADA testing? If so, what are your thoughts about it? So something that even Colby says all the time. I'm not one to say if they are or not. All I'm going to say is if there is a fighter that happened to get around it, by the way he just looks and the way he fights... Usman would be the number one candidate with now Romero being gone. With Adesanya, it's only the gyno. Nothing about him really shows any kind of PDD issue or something like that. The guy I always like to reference is more plates, more dates. He knows a lot more about this. And according to what he said, there's a lot of things to be suspicious about when you look at Usman and Adesanya and not just about the way they look. So do I think they found their way around the testing? I don't think they did. But in a hypothetical world, if anybody did, I think Usman would be the number one candidate. And then with a Gurman Klar. Hey Weasel, in one of your previous videos, you said that maybe no heavyweights in the past could have beaten Nganu in their prime. But what about Prime DC? I always thought his pressure and insane wrestling skill can even give a current version of Nganu a lot of problems. Love your videos, bro. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, I believe Prime DC might be one of the hardest fights. He's very used to wrestling these bigger guys. I mean, like, look what he did to Josh Barnett and Bigfoot Silva. Bigfoot is huge, man. The thing, though, is Nganu is not as easily to get on balance. He's a lot faster, more dangerous than those guys. And his wrestling has greatly improved. Out of 10 fights, I could probably see DC winning 4 of them. Very close fight in my opinion. He might be the hardest fight for Francis Ngannou. The forward pressure can do a lot of backing up Ngannou. But at the same time, it puts himself in danger of getting hit by the jabs, the uppercuts, the left hook counters. But at the same time, every time Ngannou is going to throw punches because of that close range that they're in, DC is going to go under for the single leg. And nobody in the heavyweight division throws better single legs. If he gets Ngannou down, how long can he hold him down? That's another question as well. He could potentially get Ngannou's back. Yeah, I could probably see DC being the hardest fight for Francis Ngannou. Then with a Gregory Claxton. What should fighters like Darren Till and Kelvin Gaslam do? They're both clearly skilled but they can't seem to put everything together in addition to the brutal weight cuts to get back down the welterweight keep up the amazing content man. thank you so much it's a bit of an issue here's the thing about kelvin gaslam now he's a little bit different of a case because he can make the weight it just doesn't seem like he's disciplined enough to do it darren till i believe is honestly too big i mean we've seen him down there he's too big for the weight class he's massive against those guys but at middleweight, he's a little small. He's like a Kevin Lee, but in between the welterweight and middleweight division. If there was a 175, he would be there and he would still be pretty big. Kelvin Gaslam, I believe, can fight at 170. If Kelvin decides to go back down the welterweight, he would be at least a top 10 fighter. Maybe even top 5. But these days, man, he just can't deal with the bigger guys wrestling. Then we go to Z. Hey, Weasel, how do you see these Colby Covington matchups going? Colby versus Habib at welterweight. I think Habib wins for sure. I think Habib would take Colby to the ground eventually. And I could see Colby giving something up like his back. Whatever it is, and Habib is going to take it. On the feet, it would be interesting. That would be a good fight on the feet. I think Colby might be able to edge it slightly. But Habib is someone who can make things work. Even as sloppy as he could look sometimes. I believe he has more power than Colby. I believe he's faster than Colby. His shots come from unusual angles. And Habib is excellent at pulling away from punches. He could definitely make Colby miss and overextend with his shots. Then Colby versus Hamzad at welterweight. I'm going to have to go with Hamza on this one. I think he does take down Colby. And on the feet, he might have too much power combined with that speed. And his footing might be better than Usman's. It's a little too early to say for sure. But as of what we see, I might lean to Hamza. Colby versus Oliveira at lightweight. Oh, that's pretty interesting. At lightweight? I don't know how Colby would look. But I don't like the drop in weight. I might go with Oliveira at lightweight. At welterweight or something in between, I would go with Colby Covington. I think he might be too drained going down to lightweight. I know he doesn't weigh that much. I know he's pretty light for welterweight. But looking at his frame, I don't know how much more weight can come off him. He looks pretty lean all year round. And the way his frame is, how tall he is, I just don't know if he's going to be healthy down there. And then we'll get to Lee Aloughlin. If Izzy beats Whitaker again, what do you think Whitaker will do? I could see him fighting a way back to the title. Or do you think he moves up to 205? If Izzy beats Whitaker again, Whitaker better hope Izzy retires or something, man. Because he might never be able to fight his way back. He could beat everybody else. But like, do we honestly want to see Whitaker versus Izzy over and over again if let's say Izzy keeps knocking him out 205 could be a possibility I mean there's no way Whitaker goes to 170 let's just throw that out the window if Whitaker is going to move weight classes he would go up to 205 he could be pretty good up there I'm not going to lie here because I don't think a lot of guys are going to be able to wrestle him that well and definitely do not see a lot of guys out striking him the power difference might be a little bit too much I mean he gets dropped by middleweights 
Imagine your Prohaska lands an uppercut on him, you know? That might be terrifying. But I think he could be pretty successful at 205 for sure. At middleweight, he's going to be a gatekeeper to that championship. He's just going to be the number one guy fighting everybody off. He's like a second champion in the division, just like defending his number one contender spot. And then we get to Billy Smith. How would have Michael Chandler done against Habib had Justin Gaethje pull out of their fight? I feel Chandler's wrestling speed and power could give Habib problems. He's also way better at BJJ than Gaethje, yeah, for sure. We'll love to hear your thoughts. I definitely think that Chandler is a harder fight than Justin Gaethje was because there's two things here. Chandler is very precise with that right hand, right? Moving backwards or moving forward, whatever it is, he always has the equalizer. He hits harder than Justin Gaethje. And number two, when he gets taken down, it's not going to be a wrap. Habib taking on Gaethje, if there's enough time for him to work, right? Give him 10 to 15 seconds, that fight's over. Against Chandler, it's not like that. Chandler is very good on the ground. He's extremely crafty. Remember, he submitted marching held he held his own on the ground with you know benson henderson eddie alvarez he's a well-rounded fighter that fight would definitely go past the second round right the power threat is too much for habib to engage him on the feet like that he might try to push chandler backwards but it's not going to be as easy as he pushed back justin gaethje when he meets with chandler there's always that big right hand it's going to be very similar to the way habib fought uh, michael johnson because of the speed factor he didn't want to press michael johnson that way because he would fall into a left hand that he wouldn't be able to see coming i mean at one time he got caught by a right hook that could be a similar thing with michael chandler here so it's a little bit different and michael chandler is a lot harder to take down than michael johnson was michael johnson is nowhere close as good on the ground as chandler is this could be a very tough fight for habib in the first two rounds after like two and a half rounds i believe habib starts to dominate then what is zeke malikou is benson henderson the most fight to the level of a competition fighter of all time was watching his recent win and realized he almost never gets dominated and never dominates a fighter either i think it's due to his style where he's super well-rounded but doesn't have the path to victory that's ultimately what it comes down to he's good at everything He's defensively sound, he's good offensively, but at the same time, he's not a guy that has a lot of finishing qualities. He's also not a high output fighter. If you make a big mistake, he's able to catch you like he caught Frank Yeager with the upkick. But most of the time, he doesn't find those kind of openings. He doesn't even try to create those kind of openings. And he's ultimately just fighting you in neutral ground, neutral action, just beating you at the punch, defending your shots better, stops your takedowns, takes you to the ground, doesn't really chase a finish on top of you. The round ends, fight continues again in the next round, lands a jab, punches you in the leg, and yes, he does that. Kicks you to the leg sometimes, moves away from your shot, blocks your punch, retreats, circles around, gets back to the center, front kicks you away, waits for you to come back to him. Like, this is what happens in his fights a lot, especially in his prime. The only guy he really dominated was Nate Diaz, because back in those days, man, leg kicks and holding Nate to the ground was too easy for Benson to do. That was like the only guy that he was able to dominate. I believe the closest guy that got to dominating him from like start to finish was maybe Michael Chandler. But that wasn't Benson in his prime. Yeah, man, Benson's always been a very strange anomaly in the sport. A lot of people said the same thing about John Jones, right? John Jones, they say he fights the level of competition, especially later in his career. It was something a lot of people were saying after he beat those old veterans, right? When he fought Gustafson, when he fought OSP, the first time against Daniel Cormier. A lot of people were saying that he matches the energy of his opponent. Then go to Johnny Mikrowski. After his performance against Harris, how much intrigue would you have in a matchup against Shavkat Rachmanov and Hamza Shemaev? And who do you favor? It just seems like this fight is going to be inevitable. This is a long brewing rivalry we're waiting for. They're both the same age. Both have a similar amount of fights in the UFC. Both guys seem to be somewhat well-rounded. So much promise. The biggest prospects in the welterweight division right now. Right, it's something like we thought about when uh, Kamar Usman and Colby Covington were rising up. Right, they were eventually going to fight each other, but we didn't know they were going to be rivals. Armin Saryuk and Islam Makhachev fought each other early. Maybe those two guys become rivals. Rivalries against prospects is so fun, man. I think the time these two guys fight each other might be if they become top five fighters. Right now, it looks like Hamza might be able to get there pretty soon. Shafkat just got into the top 15. Now, who do I favor if they fight each other? I don't know, man. It's so hard to pick because there's more unknowns about Hamza. We've seen Shafkat's skills. We've seen what he does from the ground to the clinch to stand up everything we see him even deal with adversity in the regional scene before he got caught one time with hamzat we still don't know too much about his stand-up the most we saw is when he fought Eliskarov. everything else i mean one punch knockout some good footwork here and there but not too much extensive and that fight with Eliskarov was three years ago so here's the thing if hamza is going to win this I believe he might be able to catch Shafkat with his right hand. He might be able to take Shafkat to the ground, but it's hard to see him having a major advantage where he's absolutely dominating Shafkat. Right, Shafkat is extremely skilled on the ground, man. He might be able to fight Hamza off or make his way back up to the feet. Everything else on the feet, I see Shafkat have an advantage. I'm going to go with Hamza, but that's a close fight to think about. Then when Aguiath fights, Kamar Usman said he considered moving up to 205 to fight Jan when he was the champ. What do you think? Keep up the entertaining content. 
Usman is crazy. Okay, I understand if he was like a striker, he was fast, you know, all this stuff. He's a wrestler. He's going to strike with those guys. He's not wrestling Jan. That's going to be so hard for him to do, right? Jan is so much bigger than him, right? He's like three inches taller. He has an inch reach advantage and maybe 30 to 40 pounds on top of him. Usman's muscle bound, but he's nowhere as thick as Jan is. Jan is a massive human being. It would be interesting. I would love to watch it. I like these kind of fights. But at the same time, it's crazy. He has a much better chance of beating Israel Adesanya. I understand they don't want to fight each other. But he has a much better chance in that one than he does fighting Jan. Even fight Glover Tashira. That's a tough fight, man. If guys like Thiago Santos couldn't knock him out, you know, if Anthony Smith couldn't knock him out, it's hard to imagine Usman does. Hey, but if they want to make it, I'll watch it for sure. Then with a Tyler Kelly. If Ngannou were to defend his belt against Jones and then a trilogy with Stipe, is he the heavyweight GOAT? Yes, 100%, for sure, because he would have three title defenses, which is the record, so tying Stipe's record, beat better competition than Stipe did, less losses than Stipe has, it's a no-brainer. Ngannou would be the greatest heavyweight of all time. And not just the greatest heavyweight of all time, you might even push him to top five greatest fighters of all time. Then what bantamweight in history has the best chance of beating future Jan, and how would they do it? I believe Corey Sandhagen has the best chance in history. Dominic Cruz gets destroyed. Hennebrow would not be able to match him up on the feet. TJ Dillashaw would be slippery, but in my opinion, he's a lot more obvious than what Corey Sandhagen was able to show. Corey has at least the height and reach to him. TJ's going to be a little bit shorter than Jan. He has a wrestling aspect to his game, but the most complex thing about TJ compared to someone like Corey Sandhagen is his footwork. That's it. Everything else, Corey, I believe, has a harder puzzle to solve. I think Corey Sandhagen might be the hardest fight for Piotr Jan in history. Number two, I would say TJ Dillashaw in his prime. Then I would say Hennem Barrow. Then with a CB sniper. Hey Weasel, I'm an optical technician. Oh wow. And looking at the strength of Charlie Olive's spectacles, you could tell by how distorted his head looks when you focus on the size of his lenses and how small his pupils become when wearing them. He's exceptionally short-sighted. At a glance, he could have minus 10 diopter prescription. The fact that he can gauge distance in the cage so well is beyond me. He has a sort of prescription I describe as lucky to not have a Labrador. Love the content. Keep it up, brother. Thank you so much. So that is interesting. Well, I actually never heard it from that perspective. Um, If I'm not wrong, minus 10 diopter is pretty severe. People actually get surgery to get that corrected because it's so short-sighted. I can show you like an example right here. This is from someone called Kev's World. If you guys want to go look at his uh, YouTube channel, he pretty much talks about how going through life with a minus 11 diopter is. It's a little bit worse than minus 10. It's pretty severe. You can barely tell what's in front of you. I mean, this is how it is looking at your phone. According to an optical technician, if Oliveira does have a minus 10 diopter, it's very similar to this. This is very similar to how he fights in the cage. No wonder the guy doesn't move his head. He can't even see the punches coming at him. Wow, that is so crazy. Thank you, CV Sniper, for sharing this. It definitely explains a lot. I mean, Oliveira said when he goes on the streets without his glasses, he's pretty much blind. If this is true, I have a whole new respect for Charles Oliveira, more than I already do. Him and Michael Bisping and these guys who come into a fight with a natural disadvantage and happen to become champions, defend their titles, all that stuff. They deserve their own, they deserve their own category in terms of like greatness. It's absolutely insane. This guy beat Dustin Poirier like this. How do you beat Dustin Poirier almost blind? How do you beat Michael Chandler? and Dustin Poirier with bad vision. And now he's going up against Justin Gaethje too? This is the hardest division in the entire UFC, and Oliveira is on top of it with barely being able to see. And then we go to Mike Harms. What was your worst prediction for a fight? You thought it would go one way, but it went the complete opposite. As everybody who makes predictions, we all get something horribly wrong. And mine was Ioana versus Jessica Andrade. I didn't give Ioana too much credit in that one. That was like when she started to change her style as a champion, right? She fought differently before a champion as she did when she became champion. I thought the new style wasn't going to be that good against Jessica Andrade. It showed to be the complete opposite, right? It was one of the few fights where I didn't give a fighter much of a chance like a path to victory. For an example, when I was predicting Amanda Nunes versus Juliana Pena, I at least predicted a path to victory for Juliana Pena to win, but I didn't think that was going to happen, right? Pena actually won very similarly to that path to victory I gave, but I didn't think that was going to happen. For Ioana versus Jessica Andrade, I didn't really give Ioana much of a, much of a path. That fight was a long time ago. That was like, what, 2017? And then with a JG, John Joel said he got paid $5 million a fight, despite his disclosed pay being $500,000. And DC said he got paid $3 million a fight, but his disclosed pay was a few hundred thousand. What do you think about this? Do you think fighters are actually underpaid and just use the disclosed pay as a public leverage? Interesting question right there. But yeah, that's really good money. It doesn't surprise me. You know, higher end fighters making that much. John Jones, 5 million a fight. That's it. He should be making more than 10 mil every fight just by doing comparisons. And for Daniel Cormier, he should have been making more than 3 mil a fight as well. Does pay-per-view points really give him that much more? It might because, for an example, this close pay might be just guaranteed. On the contract, that's what you're getting every fight. John Jones saying he got paid 5 mil a fight 
he was regularly drawing like 600 to 700,000 buys. For DC, he took part of large fights as well. So I think majority of that is from the pay-per-view money. And the 500,000, I think, is like a regular championship base pay. The reason why the pay-per-view points might be so much is because when you look at Conor McGregor, his disclosed pay was, what, $3 million? And then afterward, he said he got paid $50 million or $30 million. That would have rammed Shaw Nation. Do you see Colby Covington going more down the celebrity fighter route if he beats Jorge? He doesn't seem interested in fighting top contenders like Burns or Luke as he's calling out Dustin for another super fight. Yeah, he pretty much made it well known a long time ago that he was in this to make money. So celebrity fighter, that's what he's going to do. He wants the Jorge fight. He wants the big money fights. And who could really blame him? If there's no one out there, if there is no super fight, I think he would take a top contender. But super fights, money fights, celebrity fights come first. And that's the end of the podcast, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to give a video a like and make sure to subscribe. Don't forget to get that VPN, private internet access. And I'll see you guys in the next video.